Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am once again joined by Max, uh, who is rapidly becoming our resident Soviet Russian firearms expert. So, uh, Max, you have a cool one for us today. We're gonna, what trifle are we going to talk about? Hello, guys. Uh, today we are talking about Drogunov SVD, Drogunov Sniper Rifle. There is a lot of misconceptions, a very little practical information on the English language web. So I'm prepared a little bit of history, and some facts and so on. So basically, during uh, great, uh, World War II, Soviet Army had two sniper rifles. One was the old classic Mosin sniper rifle, which was developed as a sniper rifle during 1930s and very extensively used during the war. So here goes the picture of the Zeitz of the Mosin rifle. Okay. Second rifle was the Tokarev SVT-40. It was less popular as a sniper rifle because it was less accurate. It has some inherent issues with dispersion, but not, nevertheless, some snipers preferred it because it uh, permitted faster follow-up shots. Not every day you have to shoot at, say, five or 700 meters. Quite often the enemy was only 100, 200 meters, but rapidly moving. So you need to make a couple of shots, just you may need to make several shots to silence a machine gun or something like this. He goes with photo of Ludmila Pavlyuchenko with her Tokyo. So basically, when the war was finished, victory was achieved, there was a big rebuilding of the Soviet military doctrine. But for a time being, sniper rifle was left in the ground. There was a brief attempt to put a sniper scope on the Simonov SKS carbine, but it didn't work well. Cartridge was a little bit weak, the accuracy was not so good, so the idea didn't work. But then uh, things began to change when NATO, NATO began to implement its new, its first rearmament, because star, standard NATO rifle was new, semi or full automatic battle rifle, semi automatic rifle firing full power. Ammunition. What was more important that a squad automatic weapons like machine guns fired the same ammunition. So squad for squad, Western infantry had longer range than the Soviet infantry armed with intermediate power weapons. So in short, during the close combat, urban combat, in woods. So Soviet infantry had a market advantage because it carried more ammunition. It was lighter ammunition and lighter weapons, faster firing. But as range increased, say open plains, some Western Europe probably still uh, being allied by nuclear explosions, uh, Western troops had advantage in practical range. Not only riflemen, mostly light machine guns. So it was decided that Soviet infantry need some, something like a longer arm, something to reach out and to be able to effectively suppress machine guns and early anti-tank weapons, which posed significant danger to armored personnel carriers and tanks, like early grenade launchers, bazookas, first-generation anti-tank guided missiles. So, uh, putting uh, squad automatic, making squad automatic back into this 7.62 x 54 cartridge was out of question for logistical reasons. So, it was decided to develop a semi-automatic sniper rifle. Semi-automatic, it was in American, modern, Western, Nomenclature, it's not a true sniper rifle, it's more like a designated marksman rifle. 
So in about uh, 50, uh, 1957, requirements were drawn for a new semi-automatic rifle equipped with a special scope which should be developed as well and able to fire standard ammunition 7.62x54 uh, ringed. That was initially three contenders participating in the trials. It was uh, Dragunov, Konstantinov and Simonov. Konstantinov and Simonov both were experienced small arms developers, especially Simonov. Dragunov was youngest of them all. However, he already he was trying it as a gunsmith before the war. He worked in Nizhevsk, so he had actually a ground working with small arms. And after the war, he worked on several target rifles, initially based on a Mosin design. So he had known quite a lot about precision shooting. What is also important, he was a very good target shooter himself. So basically, he was not just a designer, engineer, he built, he tried to build rifle according to his own experiences and his own ideas about what need to be for target shooting. So, in 1958, those three rifles were first put to trial. Rifles were still equipped with all, all type for magnification scope, which was still used uh, since the World War II. New scope, a PSO-1, was still in development and was ready only toward the end of the trials. It was interesting to look at uh, the uh, Simonov, which was probably most experienced of, of them all, failed the first. He was <laughs> basically at the end of his practical career. So he more or less designed it, stretched it out a SKS with detachable magazine. It was reliable, so on, but it was not sufficiently accurate. So Simonov had little idea about building precision rifles. Konstantinov rifle was very interesting because it had an inline design. Hmm. And early prototypes had a plastic stock and forend. Well, before the state oak, it had a steel receiver, but the complete uh, stock pistol grip and forend were made from a bakelite plastic, from the hmm. typical Soviet brown bakelite. Problem was that uh, during the tests, the inline, inline design would be a bad idea because uh, felt recoil was very painful. And the stock tended to hit the shooter into the cheekbone. So testers required gun to be redesigned. The Dragunov rifle, as it's interesting, changed quite a little during the redesign. Here's a, you should put a picture of SSV-58 prototype. The most important change from the early prototype to the war rifles that has been adopted as a result of the trials was an iron sight. Because Dragunov believed that the diopter sight, the peep sight, is much better for a precision shooting than the typical U notch sight. So his early prototype has a diopter type rear sight. Adjustable. Uh, uh, other changes that can be visible on the photo are lack of a flash hider and lack of a bayonet mount, which were insisted on by the uh, Soviet Army. Not something that a, uh, a precision shooter would necessarily think to put on the rifle. <laughs> yes, but still it was because it was uh, the shooter was required to operate within a squad. 
he had to participate in many charges. It was expected from time to time. <clears throat> it is interesting to note that despite the rivalry between Konstantinov and Dragunov, uh, some accounts say that they actually became friends, or at least they had very good relations. Because, for example, uh, Konstantinov helped Dragunov to design a reliable uh, 10 shot magazine for the new rifle. Because building a good magazine for a remit munition is a complicated thing. In return, Dragunov helped to uh, produce uh, precision barrels, which were made in Izhevsk, for a Konstantinov rifle. For some reason, Izhevsk barrels were considered better in terms of accuracy than the ones from the Tula by Konstantinov. Okay. So, nevertheless, it was a fierce competition between them, and in the end, military decided that the Drugunov rifle is a better of the two. And in 1963, Drugunov rifle was adopted as a SVD, Sniper Skarentovka Drugunova, along with PSO-1 uh, for magnification sniper scope. One interesting thing is that at the moment of adoption, there was no dedicated uh, sniper ammunition, Soviet military support. There was only one mass issued type of ammunition with LPS light ball with a bullet weighting 9.6 grams, 148 grains, with a steel core, but it was intended mostly for machine gun use. It was not so accurate. So to achieve best possible accuracy, Dragunov built his rifle for a, a commercial sporting extra ammunition. It was, it was not really commercial, it was not openly sold back then in the Soviet Union, but it was produced for a sport, uh, sport, sport clubs. It was very accurate, but it uh, was quite heavy, uh, bullet weighted 13 grams, it's exactly 200 grains. So, to get the best results with this extra ammunition, uh, Dragunov designed his rifle uh, with barrel with rifling with one turn in 320 millimeters. It's about 20 and a half inches for one turn. So, it should more or less good with LPS and shoot very well with extra ball. Problem was, military was not buying extra for its frontline snipers. So they found that we had a very good rifle, but no good ammunition for it. And they had to request development of a special sniper grade ammunition, which was designated as 7N1. It was produced only toward the end of the 60s. Uh, to achieve the same ballistic uh, property, same trajectory with uh, LPS, it had all, almost the same uh, bullet weight. It also had a two-part design. So more, most Western sniper ammunition has only a lead in the core. So it's a brass jacket and a lead core. Soviet 7 and 1 ammunition had a steel jacket and core that was a part lead at the rear and part mild steel at the front. Mm. This way it had the same weight and same ballistic as LPS ball, which also had a, a steel core and it had slightly improved penetration against it. Uh, light barriers like helmets and so on. So, it's for a time, for some time, uh, Dragunov rifles were produced with this slow rifling, but in around uh, 1974, the military requested Izhevsk Factor, which was the sole producer of Dragunov rifles, to change the rifling back to the standard 240 millimeters, or nine uh, and a half inches for two. Problem was that because Soviet sharpshooters were part of a squad, they often were required to shoot uh, ammunition other than ball, tracer or armor piercing. 
and those special ammunition produced very bad results with a slow rifle. So, army decided they are you know, willing to sacrifice at least some long range accuracy with sniper ball to get a good accuracy with armor piercing and with tracer and uh, explosive from no sporting ammunition. So it's all like us, it was a compromise. So we had to, instead of get a very accurate rifle, which can shoot only one type of ammunition, they had a pretty good, but not fantastic rifle, but, but it could shoot uh, every ammunition with pretty satisfactory results. One aspect is a lot of people are saying that Dragunov is not a true sniper rifle because it's not really accurate. Yes, if you are shooting commercial ammo, when you are shooting like a cheap mill suit LPS ball, you won't get a one minute accuracy like you get with say, expensive commercial ammunition, expensive Western rifles. However, a standard military requirements for SVD to be accepted from a factory were as follows. You must know I will consult with a paper to be precise. So the rifle was tested with three groups, each 10 rounds each, not three, not five, 10 rounds. So to be accepted with the LPS ball, uh, all groups should be no bigger than uh, 14 centimeters. This is at 100 meters distance? Yeah, 100 meter distance. So it's basically about uh, five minutes of angle with LPS ball. Worst group should be no bigger than that. With the uh, seven and one sniper ball, same three groups, 10 rounds each, 100 meters, all, no group should be more larger than nine centimeters. That's three minutes of angle, but basically it's 30 rounds. So if you shoot only three or five round groups, you can easily get, yes, smaller up to say one minute, if your rifle is well cared for and if you have a good ammunition. With extra ammunition or with some branches of commercial like extra light ammunition, you can get even better. But you had to be a really good shooter because it's not a truly sniper rifle, it's trigger, not really a sniper. It has to be safer for military use because you can often shoot it under a stress and so on. But still, it was pretty good. So, normally, so Soviet, so standard Soviet training for us ready required uh, sniper to be able to engage a head-sized target like this at 500 meters with a first shot. Uh, so, sorry, a no, a maximum of second shot. No more than two shots for a head-sized uh, target, no more than one shot for a chest-sized target at 500 meters. That's like the American call a minute of best guy, <laughs> 500 meters. Okay. Pretty good for a military issue. A rifle which should be issued to every squad in mechanized infantry. So it was uh, mass produced, but not it's, it's like comparing comparing to what I checked the number of say during the 70s, Ishmash factory produced about half half a million Kalashnikovs per year. And about five to seven thousand Dragunovs per year. Okay. So, but it was still produced in thousands, maybe sometimes <laughs> tens of thousands. So, for several decades, it was mostly unchanged until uh, 80s. First development in this video same came when the first forend and when the shoulder stock was replaced with the black plastic. Because plastic is cheaper, it better holds better, it's, it's more durable, so it's more practical for use. However, there were some developments which were like uh, side shows, which never 
ended in something practical, but still are very interesting. First, it's from 1970. In 1970, Dragunov attempted to develop a, an automatic rifle based on SVD. It was called V70. And uh, basically, it was the same SVD with modified trigger to allow for select fire with slightly heavier barrel, bipod, and special magazines in 15 in 20 rounds. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. most of those magazines were lost. It's only records of them being existed. It's not clear what was the reason of this development, because it was still too light to be a like, squad automatic. But nonetheless, it was produced and briefly tested. Another interesting offshot of the SVD program was an, uh, from also uh, early 70s was an attempt to read barrel SVD to 5.45 millimeters. Mm -hmm. So it was basically also a test bed to see if a short stroke gas piston gives some effect on dispersion on accuracy in full automatic. So it basically was a salt rifle, shortened SSVD, rebarrel it to 5.45. Next development from the 70s was attempt because the rim of Soviet cartridge was really obsolete. So Soviet army wanted something with more reach, with better accuracy, more flat shooting, and so on. So one of attempts tested by Soviet so small arms of Soviet ammunition experts was to develop a subcaliber ammunition. Basically, uh, arrow, small arrow-like projectiles like SPIW, but a little bit bigger, heavier for use in machine guns and sniper rifles. They used initially a standard uh, 7.62 remit cartridge, naked out to 10 millimeters and loaded with a uh, uh, fin stabilized flechette, weighing for about four to five grams with muzzle velocity of slightly more than 1,000 meters per second. It was very flat shooting. It had less recoil. But problem was uh, they had a hard time to get a needed dispersion for a sniper rifle. It machine guns, it worked like a charm. Mm. Because it was good dispersion, very low recoil, uh, because it uh, was shot from a smooth bore barrel. The barrel life was close to infinity, where you easily had uh, 30,000 shots with no visible wear from a barrel. But in sniper rifle, the accuracy was a problem because the Sabbath separation and accuracy flight fin stabilized projectile was, a, was an issue. Cool. There, was, there were several designs, but no one went too far because in the 80s, someone at the top decided that the, uh, discarding Sabbath fin stabilized ammunition is a little bit too much for it. Infantry, so it's a little bit too advanced. And look, Americans failed with, with their development, so probably we are risking too. So let's go a more conservative, more like more fail safe way, and produce a traditional cartridge with better ballistics. So we designed it a seven, a six millimeter cartridge with case, rimless case, 49 millimeter long and produced all several machine guns and several sniper rifles and, and SVD of shot in this cartridge as well. But uh, it was a very hot cartridge because its muzzle velocity was in excess of 1,100 meters per second. Wow. Bullet weight was about five and a half gram. Yes, it was flat shooting, recoil was not bad, but the real problem was the barrel wear. Because with this ultra magnum class muzzle velocity, you had very fast barrel wear. Friction from powder, 
feet. So we never really solved this problem. And the fall of Soviet Union, all those developments collapsed, and the Russian army still uses old limited ammunition. So uh, there was a brief attempt to save a little bit of money to produce as we give it stamp at steel receiver in the 80s. Not so surprisingly, it failed because it was either had to be a very thick and heavy, or it became to flex and accuracy suffered. Here is a photo of stamp and steel SVD, but it never went beyond prototypes. When the Soviet Union fell, but the development of CD continued. Probably one of the most famous of shots of SVD is the SVU-A and SVU-AS bullpup sniper rifles. Initially, those were developed in ANTS uh, on request for airborne troops to produce a more compact sniper rifle for uh, airborne troops. Mm. But but when Airborne decided that we prefer a conventional, not, not bullpup people. In the 1980s, this design was resurrected in Tula, and they began to convert the SVD rifles to bullpup design. And some were bought by Soviet MVD, Internal Affairs Ministry, Basically, to arm our own equivalent of special weapons of and tactics troops. SVU were used in Chechen war, and used in a lot of operation against organized crime. It's basically, it was uh, in this basic SVU configuration, it was just a SVD converted to bullpup. Initial SVU had a scope moved forward because it was a bullpup. It had a new pistol grip with long linkage back to the original trigger unit. It also had new iron sets on folding bases and a new muzzle device, which was a flash hider and a little bit of sound moderator. Then came an SVU-A, which featured a select fire capability. So for a small units operating it was a little bit of do-it-all weapon for really small uh, units which were unable to carry proper machine gun in the woods or say even maneuvering in the city. So in a critical moment of time, it could provide a little bit of suppressive fire. So, amb ambush, counter ambush. And final version was SVU-AS, which added a uh, folding by port hmm. for a better stability. So it was actually it was quite popular for like, urban operations and so on because it was shorter, it was easier to get into cars and out of the cars, easier to operate inside the buildings and so on. But it never was a military weapon. It was mostly for uh, special law enforcement operations. Okay. So for military use, when the military wanted a more compact weapon for paratroopers, special troops. First, we adopted an SVDS, a folded version of SVD. Here is the photo, which was basically the uh, same rifle. The barrel chopped it off a little, with shorter flesh hider, and with side folding stock. So it was interestingly that some people claim that it was actually a little bit more accurate, accurate than a traditional SVD because of a shorter barrel. Hmm. So it's still issued to uh, airborne troops, it's still used by some special elements of Russian army which need a shorter, uh, more compact sniper rifle. But when in mid-90s, so Russian army experts looked around and said, okay, West is trying to get in pipeline a bigger round, like 338 Lapo. Why don't we get a something like this? A little bit more punch and a little bit more range. Problem is we don't have a little. Uh, we don't have money, so let's do something with as little money as possible. So the cheapest way 
to produce a bigger, heavier sniper rifle <clears throat> was to take a commercial Tiger hunting rifle, which was actually a sportierized uh, SVD, and which was produced uh, in 9.3x64 Brennecke hunting ammunition. It is very powerful hunting ammunition to be used on wild boar, on deer, on moose. So we decided, okay, let's load this cartridge with a little bit better, more precision bullet, and let's make a sniper rifle. So it was called SVDK from Krupnokalibernya, large caliber. But the problem was it indeed was a heavy hitter, but it was not a long range heavy hit because the cartridge was originally medium or short range hunting load and it was unable to get a long range accuracy, say out more than six or eight hundred meters. The problem was the Soviet army has no, Russian army has no practical concept of use of this weapon. So we tested it, tried it and decided, okay, we don't need it anymore. So it was just a test just to see if we can do something for nothing, for almost nothing. Of course, it's not a way of course. So the last for now in the SVD line is SVD-M rifle adopted by Russian army in 2015. It was upgraded on request of the Russian army because the most important issue was to replace the quite old PSO scope with something better than new. Uh, original SVD was fitted with a uh, side mount, which required a special dog leg mount, which added weight and boom to the rifle. And if you need to mount a, say, a heavy scope, you need this uh, dog leg mount also to be heavy and bulky. And well, it was less than ideal solution for modern scopes. Russian army uh, said, okay, we need something with more modern uh, scope interface. And while we on it, let's make it a little bit handier and probably a bit longer barrel. So, okay, we don't need a bayonet anymore, but we need a little bit more uh, accuracy, especially in longer strings of fire, because there were actual experience from a field from Afghanistan, from a Chechen war, where just one or two snipers armored with SVD and taking vantage position, holding much larger units of Mujahids, so like terrorists, for extended periods of time, from just providing, providing medium range suppressive fire, very precision suppressive, suppressive, little fire, but uh, a thin pencil like SVD barrel loses accuracy really fast over long periods. It's okay if you shoot, say, one or two hundred meters, but if you have to shoot at, say, 500 meters from a hot barrel, you're losing some accuracy. So the SVD-M had a heavier, shorter barrel with new flash hider. It had a new folding top cover with Picatinny rail, new shoulder stock with adjustable cheek rest, adjustable shoulder pad, and it was used with the new variable power scopes, day scopes and night scopes. So overall it was a better rifle, but still firing the same old ammunition. So it can still shoot the same old LPS ammunition if you don't have anything else. It can still shoot the 7N1 sniper ammunition, and it also, the best of all, can shoot the new 7 and 14 uh, sniper grade improved penetration ammunition. Mm. The 7 and 14 ammunitions still had a two part core, but instead of mild steel, it had a pointed uh, front part made from tool grade steel hardened. So it can penetrate the body armor, it can penetrate the car bodies, and so on, much better than even an LPS bow. It's not really an armor-piercing ammunition like we only have, say, 
tungsten core or the full size uh, hardened steel uh, penetrator core, but it's still much better than any lead core ammunition. And it's uh, almost a much great. So it's a minute of angle ammunition. And from the SVDM, it's really, with SVDM, it's really a minute of angle complex sniper system, which you can use for military purposes. So you say you need to engage uh, anti-tank uh, crew, or you need to engage a machine gunner, or just infantry in a field. And it's because it has a folding stock, you can easily get in or out of an APC or a helicopter, or you can shoot from inside a building. And even if required, you can try to shoot with the stock folded, but of course it's not ideal. But still, as we did, lives on. There are attempts to produce a better rifle, which of course can be done. There are attempts to produce uh, rifles in Western calibers, for, especially for NVD. But so far, Russian army is using the SVD on a very broad basis. And it's not like it's going to go anytime soon. Yes, there are attempts. There is, for example, like Kalashnikov concern produced the SVG sniper rifle, which also can be had in the same caliber and use the same magazines. But it's still several years off before it can be really fielded. And even if it's adopted, it's a, a lot of years before it can completely replace the SVD in you know, a quite big rationale. So, overall, it was an exceptional weapon for its time. Basically, it was first designated marksman rifle, pur purpose designer from a scratch. Not the accurized, hand-picked, standard-issue rifle. They're like M13 or G, uh, G3 ZF and so on. It was first purpose built designated marksman rifle. And basically, it's set of pattern. So today we can see a lot of Western armies are buying similar rifle, but 7.62 NATO and without bayonet mounts. But okay, maybe we will go, get down to it eventually. But basically, the concept was right. It was born out of necessity. Because troops with a short, medium-range weapons need something a bit of longer reach. So it's the same situation which you can see today in the NATO. Absolutely. That was fascinating. Yeah. So basically, so today rifle may be a little bit updated. But it still works as intended, and if you feed it with a proper ammunition, not with cheap muscle, and if you put a good scope on it, and most of all, if you get a trained shooter, which knows how to use this particular rifle, knows its pros and cons, its strong and weak size, you still get a very good military issue designated marksman rifle, and even for some occasions, for for example, medium range work, you still get to use it as a true sniper rifle. Because you <laughs> cannot expect it to shoot at 1,000 meters, like some more expensive guns can do. But if you need to engage a valuable target at 500 meters, and you have all the tools, shooter and uh, spotter to do so, it's not a problem to do it this way. All right. Well, thank you very much, Max. That was fascinating. You're welcome. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. I'm sure you learned something new about the, the history and development of the Dragunov. I know I certainly did. Um, I think we will definitely do our best to have Max back for uh, some more illuminating looks at Russian and Soviet, Soviet uh, military arms development. Um, yes, of course. I think that's all we've got for today. Thanks.